We're continuing our study entitled, Written with the Finger of God. It is a study of the law of God in covenantal context, the definition and purpose of biblical law as it is developed in the Puritan teachings of the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms. This is sermon number four, and it's entitled, The Threefold Division of the Law of God. Our sermon text is Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 10 through 11. And we read, Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our holy God, we thank you for the privilege once again to come to study thy word. We thank you, O God, for the word that you have given to us, that inerrant and infallible word, that word which reveals to us with authority your will for us in our lives. And we ask, O God, that you would give us through thy spirit both an understanding through thy illumination of the truth, of how we are to rightfully handle the word of God, that we might demonstrate God's will, his desires for us as his people, and how that we ought to govern ourselves, just as he governs the world and holds the world accountable to him. So, Father, we ask that as we come now today, we pray that, Father, you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive, that which thy word and spirit would teach us. For we ask it in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. We are continuing our understanding concerning the nature of the law of God as it affects us under the New Testament administration of God's covenant of grace. It is a continuing covenant. It is a covenant that was given in the old, administered under other principles, now administered under new principles. But it is still the same covenant. And to us, we have a continuation of the very nature and essence of God's will for our lives personally, for how we govern our homes, how we govern our church, how we govern our society. We must not forget the law of God are God's rules for governing us both we who are his people through Jesus Christ our Lord and the world being held accountable even though they have not been renewed. Nevertheless, the will of God stands over against them. Now this Lord's Day, I want to direct your attention to two basic things. First, I want to give an overview of the threefold division of the law of God or if you will, the law of Moses, and second, to the various views and teachings on the law of God under the New Testament covenant age with an origin of the use of the term theonomy. Some of these things have got to be laid out before we come to the confession and study them so that you might be familiar with terminology today in light of how it is presented in the confession. Well, if you will, let's begin our sermon by looking at, in particular, 
the basic premise of confessional law. That is, if some have many called it, and I have no problem in agreeing with it, confessional theonomy. Here, the word theonomy, by the way, just means God's law. So when we look at this in its strictest form, the adjective is going to be very important. For us, our adjective is how the confession defines the law of God. Now, we've looked at its threefold use. Now, I want you to turn your attention to its threefold division. Now, the law of Moses, historically, was divided into three divisions or precepts of the moral, ceremonial, and judicial laws of God. The moral precepts or principles are permanent. Having been established even before the law was given to Moses. Since they are literally a part of the law of creation given by God to man as a part of that innate ethical rule in how he is to govern his life. Thus, this pre-Mosaic law given a second time to Moses, which is really a technicality. We have the law given at creation to Adam. Law of God written upon his constitutional nature. And then secondly, you have this technical restatement, but this time written with the finger of God, given to Moses to give to the people of Israel. It is an innate law. It is, in that sense, then, a biblical law. And while it is included in what is given to Moses, it does predate Moses. You must keep that in mind. It is a part of that image of God that we find man being the very image of God in that he is a reasoning, thinking, rational, moral being. And that is how the Westminster defines, definitively state, what is the image of God in man? So, from the very beginning, man, in imaging God, not only is a thinking, rational, willing being, he's also a moral being. The moral law is given to direct the commands of God to man. Thus, man, from the beginning, was in what we would really say a theonomic relationship with God, according to the creation account. There has never been a time man has ever been outside of a theonomic relationship with God. Again, I remind you, the word theonomic simply means, and here we are using it to mean God's law. The moral directives by God to Adam demonstrate that Adam both understood God he understood him by the communications through propositions, which is one aspect of the innate knowledge given to man by God as part of that image of God. And ethically, Adam understood the moral complexities of the do and don't, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How could he not? How could God command what Adam morally could not understand or act upon? And he warns him, because in the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. Or literally, the Hebrew says, dying you shall die. This, Sim 8. Sit, excuse me, this same innate law was also 
written on the stones of tablets to Israel. The Ten Commandments that were given to Moses as he carried him out of the mountain. And we just read them earlier. But again, if you will, Exodus 21 through 17 speaks to what exactly those commandments are. And this, again, is not a new law. But it is the moral law of God from creation. It predates the writing of them on the stone and the eventual appendages of ceremonial and civil laws built upon that foundation to which the establishment of civil and ceremonial must and can only be built as being a part of the will of God. Well, let's look, if you could, just for a moment at the writing of this moral law of God as it is summed up in what is called the Ten Commandments, or if you will, the Ten Words of God. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those that hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of your Lord, the Lord your God, in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's, unquote. The moral law reveals the nature of, of God's will to man. It has always done so since creation. It did during the Mosaic administration in the Old Covenant, and it still applies today under the rule of Christ in the New Testament age. Now, if I could, just a quick illustration, just so that you can see the principle of it. There is a moral law, it says, regarding the Sabbath. God tells us right in the beginning, on the seventh day, God rested and had a Sabbath, and he blessed it. From the very beginning, the seventh day is set aside as a day to worship and honor God. It did so all the way through to the time of this giving of the law to Moses on the mountain in the tablets of stone. The Sabbath then, which, which we just read, was included in those stones. It continued through the Old Testament. It comes into the New Testament. Now, there are certain aspects of that worship, that Sabbath 
those promises that are given to us that are both temporal and permanent. Clearly they spoke of a rest that we would have in Christ. It is both salvific and its fullness, when it comes to pass, will be in glorification. When all men have risen, those to eternal judgment and those unto eternal life, we have the law of God continuing, but not in all of its details. There never has been a time in creation, in history, if you will, from the very beginning with Adam, in the very things that God records in his word, Genesis 1 and 2, all the way through to the new mosaic giving of the law, through the application of that in the work of Christ, and then a continuation where Christ himself says two things sum up those Ten Commandments. We continue in them. Not everything binds us as we were bound in the Mosaic. For part of that is ceremonial as well. And so some details clearly come to an end. But the Sabbath has never been done away with because the principle of the Sabbath is moral has been from the beginning, will be till we are all resurrected and brought together in Christ in eternity. Those underlying principles are binding upon us. They're moral. Do they have aspects that are both civil as it relates to Israel and its practices? Yes. Does it have details that relate to the ceremonial? Yes. Are those binding? No. Are the moral principles that you find both in the civil and the ceremonial still binding on us? Yes. Those promises that were given in the moral law continue to be offered. Plus the binding nature that it is moral and basic to our ethical understanding of how God demands of man Obedience to his law has never been lifted from us. And by the way, we do not obey this moral law as a way to obtain salvation. We never have, and we never will. The law of God was never capable of redeeming man from his sin. But they are a means in which we are to live in the ways that are pleasing unto God. Having gained acceptance with God through Christ, that by grace alone, through faith alone. Oh, I'm not bound to many details. Many of those things were fulfilled. But the moral is never done away with. Cannot be. If you can break one commandment, you break them all. If you can destroy one, you can destroy them all. The ability of man to keep the moral law of God is based on the grace of God in Christ. That's how we are able to keep it. And these are the works that are required in salvation. Now let me explain that statement because I'm sure a lot of individuals who think they understand Calvinism don't get Calvinism. So it necessitates that I explain what it means when I say there are works that are required in salvation. Now, clearly, only the work of Christ saves. That is, only the work of Christ allows us to be just before a holy God. Can't add anything to it, can't take anything away from it. 
after justification, works are involved, which flow through the redemption that's been given to us from the work of the Holy Spirit who regenerated us to begin with. He gave us faith. He gave us repentance. He gave us adoption. He gave us sanctification, mortification. He gives us, through those saving graces, glorification in the end. What one must understand is the difference between works of merit or acceptance and works of necessity. Works for acceptance before God can only be imputed to the righteousness of Christ for us in the work that he did on the cross. But the works of necessity in salvation is you can't divide justification and sanctification from each other. There is a fruit of the Spirit that flows forth in the works that we do having been redeemed. And by justification, declared right before God, not on the basis of anything we have merited or done. There's no merit. There's no acceptance based on works for redemption. Cannot be. But having come to the place of acceptance with God, there are works of necessity in salvation. Now, that's why the Reformed held such a strong position on the Mosaic law of God with all of its moral teachings and implications that still deliver the promises and bind us thereunto. Let me say it to you in a different way. Let me use the words of the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 2. I know, it's hard to believe we're going to go back to Ephesians and something that you ought to know from memory, but we'll look at it again. Here you're going to see no works of merit, but works of necessity. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. No human merit, no acceptance based on any works that man can do before God. You've been saved through the instrument of faith, through the grace of God given in the atonement of Christ for our salvation. It is the gift of God, the salvation, the redemption, the acceptance with God, if you will. Not by works. There is no meritorious effort of man by which acceptance can be gained to God based on what he has done, what he has thought, what he has willed, or what he has done with his hand in trying to get acceptance with God. Cannot be. And thus, Paul continues, and so that no one can boast. But then he changes up, and he starts explaining the necessity of why we were created in Christ the way we were, and what was the end result. For we are God's workmanship. God created us. We come out of the work shed of God. He, having created us through His power, by His Spirit, through nothing that we could contribute. We were passive in that aspect of our salvation. We were what? Created what? He says, in Christ Jesus. Christ is the substance. I remind you, election is not. Somebody wrote, I can't understand if People already understood they were saved. They are the elect of God. Why would they need salvation? Why would they even think they're lost? And I heard all the different answers that people were trying to give to them, of which I couldn't find one that really got to the issue. And the issue is you've confused election with salvation. Christ is salvation. Election 
is unto Christ, who is our salvation, wherein we have been predestined to be transformed by the Spirit of God to being a son of the living God, taken from the kingdom of darkness, transformed into the kingdom of light. That's all the grace of God. There's nothing you can do to bring yourself into that relationship. You can't prepare yourself for it. You can't do anything to merit it, even to stand before God and him to say, oh, look, he loves me. He wills himself to me. He does. No, no, no. It is God's grace without favor, i.e., no favor on the part of man. The favor is expressed in the love of the electing God who hath brought us unto his Son, and in him we die and have redemption through his blood. We're created in Christ Jesus, what? To do good works. There's the works in salvation. I remind you, the word salvation is a very large umbrella, if you will. There are many doctrines involved. Election, predestination, atonement, adoption, sanctification, glorification. All of those are subsets of salvation. One of those in sanctification is the putting on of the righteousness of Christ and fulfilling the works that God has commanded of us in that he created us in Christ to do those good works through the power of the Spirit in our life. It's not us just sitting passively by and the Spirit doing it, but it is through the power of the Spirit that we are motivated and we do good works. That's why the Westminster Divines were so clear. You cannot separate sanctification for justification. With no justification, there is no true godly works. Because there's no good works that are works without faith. And so if you're not just before God, through Christ, you can't perform a good work. Because it would be performed without faith. And that which is not of faith is sin. But where there is justification, there of necessity must be good works, sanctification. So if someone ever says to you, and it's always a trick question, which unfortunately most of them don't know really how to ask the question, right? Right? And wouldn't know the answer even if they did, probably. Are there works involved in salvation? Yes. Not to merit or have acceptance with God. But there is works that are a result of our acceptance. That flow from the Spirit through us. As the Westminster Divines say. And all other saving graces that continue to work in us. To mature us to grow us in sanctification of life. In Calvinism, we call it what? The perseverance of the saints. We persevere in Christ. Not just passively, that just the passive side of that thing is once saved, always saved. But the real doctrine is not only are we always saved, and we only be saved one time in Christ, but then we persevere in the faith, pursuing those good works that we were created to walk in as the sons of the living God. And note how he finishes then this section off, which God prepared in advance for us to do. <laughs> For the foundation of the world, he planned these works for us, the redeemed, to do in our redemption through Christ. So do you get the principle that's involved here? That which is moral is always binding. It has been from the beginning. It has been through the Mosaic administration. It is now through Christ's administration of the New Testament. 
It will be to the end of time. We are always bound morally to do what God has commanded of us. So let that be understood. It is the necessary foundation. Well, then comes what we call the second division, which are the ceremonial precepts or principles. Or we also refer to it as the ceremonial law, which deals with the right approach and acceptable forms of worship concerning God. Now, you have a command to do that in creation, do you not? You have a command to do that with Moses. You have a command to do that in the addition, the appendages of the ceremonial law to the moral law. (coughs) In particular, (coughs) excuse me. In particular, in dealing with those first four commandments that deal with how we understand and approach God. We might say the ceremonial law speaks of ritual cleanness. These were commands given in particular with Moses for a time. They have to have a moral foundation, but they are given. They are the details given and how that we approach and we honor God. They are temporary, given for divine worship at that particular time. And what was their purpose? The foreshadowing of Christ, who was to come. Ceremonial law relates to Israel's worship in particular. It is found in Leviticus 1, 1 through 13. And that literally is the beginning of it. And I'm not going to turn there at this time. I just want you to look it up today, though, and read. As a matter of fact, read through the whole sections, the chapters that deal with all the ceremonial givings of commands by God. The ceremonial laws and their details and applications pointed forward to Christ. And those details of the ceremonies are what? No longer necessary after Jesus' death and death. Resurrection, that is, in their original intent and use prior to the coming of Christ, of what they spoke about concerning Christ. Accordingly, upon the coming of Christ, we declare that they cease to bind us. And observe them now, and to observe them now, excuse me, would be equivalent to declaring falsely that Christ has not yet come. It is for Christians a sin to maintain such a heresy, which would be opposing the clear teaching on the incarnation and the purpose and the work of Christ, both in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection, and finally his ascension under the right hand of the Father. Though we are no longer bound to these laws, the principles behind the ceremonial laws, those principles of creation, we are bound to worship God on the Sabbath. Those moral principles and the promises represented therein in matters pertaining to the worship, to the love of God, the promises of the messianic Blessings and benefits and redemption that comes through his work are still real today. And the basic moral concept of them must still bind and apply. Again, the moral law, I remind you, has been with man since his creation. 
the details prior to Moses and Israel may differ, as well as the details after the coming of Christ will differ from Moses and Israel. But from creation up to and through the Mosaic administration, through Christ's administration in the New Testament, the fundamental underlying principles of moral law has not changed one iota as it governs how man is to approach God and to worship Him. The details have been fulfilled. They're not binding. And when we look at these ever more carefully in the teaching of the Westminster Divines, representing that Puritan theology, a theology that is an even greater manifestation of the Reformational teachings, we will see that they are very definitive about this statement. Do you think that there is no moral responsibility as a believer for you to worship God? That somehow it magically disappeared when you were saved? Well, the third division that we are so normally used to dealing with is called the judicial precepts or principles, or if you will, the civil law of God. It is those that are found, for example, in Exodus 21. They came into existence with the law of Moses in their details, not moral responsibility. The moral responsibilities were already innate within man. But when it's written by God in stone, first four commandments to deal with God, the second six commandments, the second table of the law, deals with our relationship between man and man as required by God. But many of their details also only applied to Israel, but not the moral principles. The civil law dictated Israel's daily living, and there are aspects of it that are found. You can look up in Deuteronomy 24, verses 10 through 11, and just look at what's required of them in the civil code. However, modern society and culture are so radically different And some of these guidelines that were given to Israel, that they cannot literally be followed specifically as to their details. And therefore, the details were a part of the theocracy of Israel. But not the underlying moral principle. Let's just consider for an example... The scripture says that we shall not kill. That is, that there is a command for the preservation of life, that we may not only not take life, but we are to preserve life in every aspect of our life. It is our duty to preserve life. Well, in the Old Testament, there was, you know, a fencing of the roof of the house, because back in the time period of Israel, When in Israel, people many times slept at night because it was so hot out on top of the roofs. And so in order to keep them from sleepwalking and falling off, they literally built a fence around the top of the house to keep people safe, to keep them from falling off and dying. Well... I'm not sure. There might be a few places in the world you still sleep on the roof of your house at night. I doubt there are many. But we don't have that principle. The cultures differ so much, have different practices, different things that are structurally, socially different than they were in Israel. So it's not required. The detail of putting a fence around the roof of your house 
It's not required. How can it bind a society that doesn't practice such a thing? That's the temporal for Israel. But there's an underlying principle that's moral, which is what? Preservation of life. So we don't have fences around the tops of our houses. We're not bound to do so. But if you have an in-ground swimming pool that somebody in the middle of the night could be walking through your backyard, fall in and drown, you have a moral principle to preserve life. Your job is to fence in that pool to keep someone from drowning. You see the detail versus the moral. There is moral, the Ten Commandments, that is found in the nature of worshiping God. There are moral principles that are found in relationship to the governance of man. Varied detail. Having even the details removed. Do you realize the intensity, the diversity the variety of implications that are given in those commandments. How each commandment affects us in our relationship to God and in our relationship to our fellow man. The moral principles, that is, that moral law behind the commandments are binding. They're a guide in our conduct. They are fundamental to any so-called Christian ethic. Nevertheless, it should be pointed out that while the specific details of the Old Testament judicial laws were no longer binding, nevertheless, the judicial contained universal principles of justice that reflected on the nature of the moral law and how it affects man personally, socially, and governmentally. You can't escape that. It has always been with us. More detailed in Israel, more principled in the new administration under Christ. But it is our duty and responsibility to apply them to men and nations. And how that we govern ourselves, and how that we govern society. By the way, this is going to be referred to in the Westminster Confession as that general equity of the law. And in particular, we use the term the general equity of civil or judicial law of God. That which continues to bind the divine say. So you have a little understanding when they talk about equity, they're talking about the moral principles in their applications apart from the details. But those details, those case laws, what are they for us? They are demonstrations of how we, too, would apply the principles of God's moral law in our society. Unlike the ceremony on judicial precepts, moral commands continue. They are summed up in those commandments that we have read already to you concerning God giving to us that which he has commanded of us in the practice and the teaching of the Holy Scripture. How we are to apply those moral commands is another issue. It must be thought out. You must take the principles. You look how God had Israel because it's God who gave to Israel those details of how to apply them in their society. But we've got to take those principles and we need to look at how God used them and address every area of our society today. 
And we will do that in the coming weeks as we go through the law of God in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechisms. But what I want you to see more than anything else is how important it is that we understand there is a law, moral. The law is not, in a sense, divided as if God has given one law, two laws, and three laws. One law was already from creation given to man. It is rewritten on the tablets of stone. So you don't add to it and you don't take away from it. Hey, by the way, one of the reasons the high priest would listen to the king read the law was to ensure he didn't take advantage of applying the law wrong. And in giving of that law, then he adds how these civil and ceremonial appendages were to be based upon the first and the second tablets in the practice within Israel. But clearly you have the distinction of the moral, which is always binding, the application of the civil and the ceremonial, which in their details as applied to Israel do not apply to us, but the moral principles or the equity of the moral principles still bind us, and in thus, in some way, we still have ceremonial and judicial laws that bind us, but not in the way that it did to Israel. Because you can't escape the moral. Both the civil and the ceremonial are based on the moral. They're based on the ten words, the ten commandments of God. And so we never escape, whether it is in our worship to God, whether it is our personal conduct, personally, socially, does not matter, whether it is in our civil ruling in our own life, or in the life of our nation. There is always moral law that governs and binds us before God. Laws that we are forbidden to transgress. That we are required, especially if we claim the name of Christ, to keep and continue to implement you will see that in chapter 23, this is why the Westminster Divines write about what is the right relationship between church and state. What you have with the Westminster Confession of Faith is a full-orbed reform theology. If I required that in the use of the term reformed, very few would accept it. Many of our own Presbyterian churches have rejected the older confession, rewritten it to reflect more modern political and social theories. Our denomination has not. Because to alter the logical deduction of how God's law governs us, how it governs us personally, how it governs our church, how it governs our society. The three institutions God created is a telling story of how we deal with God. Somehow we think that man has come up with a better idea than God. Sometimes they think, they think God was just, he didn't have anything else to do, so he decided to create some laws. I know what I'll do. I'll create some laws. And then I'll just bind everybody to it and see how they do. And then in the end, I'll just wipe it away. And eventually, you don't have to have, and you don't have to obey. You don't have to follow anything that I have said that is the moral base of how ethically you ought to live and govern your life, both in the worship of God, in the civil applications in society, and in your personal conduct. We seriously cannot be that foolish or think so highly of ourselves 
that we are almost willing to shake our fist in the face of God and say, you had no right to bind me to this ethical standard. Not at all. Not at all. Well, I'm just going to quickly do one more thing, and I'm not going to be able to go through the varieties of views on the law of God. I will take that up next Lord's Day. But I want to just quickly talk about the fact that this whole section is called Theonomic Perspectives, and I'll come back. But again, I want you to understand our usage of, of, of certain terms. When we speak of the Mosaic Law, we speak of the moral, the ceremonial, and the civil. That's unequivocal. We've defined that out. But we know that the moral law is a regiving of what was already put in man in the created order of things. And that even, Romans chapter 5 is clear. Remember when we went through Romans? Even though man does not sin in the likeness of sinful man, as a result of Adam's original transgression, all of his posterity has fallen in him, and that law of command that God gave, that which is written upon his constitutional nature, he has continued to bind him to keep the commandments of God, and he does not do it. So when we talk about the moral law, we're talking about that innate law from the beginning. Eventually transferred to stones. But it doesn't differ from Adam in the beginning, Romans chapter 2. Even the Gentiles who do not have the tablets of stone. Hey, from the beginning, what was Adam? He was a Gentile. They still were being governed by that law, a command. Obey or die. And it continues to this day. But then we use other terms. And theonomy is the most popular term today. The historic etymology of the term theonomy. Actually, you have here two Greek terms that were put together. Theos, meaning God, and nomos, God's rule, or God's government, or God's law, if you will. That is to say, it is believed that God's law is in its moral fundamentals, whether moral, civil, or ceremonial, in the moral aspects are still binding upon us. The origin of the term is from the German word theonomy. And it is the first known, or its first known use was in 1890. But there have been diverse uses and meanings of that term, theonomy, over time. So one cannot just say theonomy. It's a misnomer. If you say theonomy without attaching any adjectives or def definitions to it, we have no idea what you're saying. But most of the time, in our contemporary time frame, theonomy has been associated with Reconstructionist theology or Reconstructionist theod. That thought, which was established and actually, to a great extent, taught by Rush Dooney and later one of his disciples or followers, Greg Bonson. But the concept of theonomy is also taught by the Puritans. And it differs from Reconstruction thinking. It's best identified in its precise meaning and usage if you go to the Westminster Confession of Faith, where it clearly teaches out what are the threefold division, what are its threefold uses, what does it mean to us, and how are we to understand its purpose, its meaning, its usage, Everything about it laid out and defined for us. There is the Puritan view. That is our view. We are Puritans. But we are not Reconstructionists. Then there is 
Paul Tillich, an existentialistic theologian who adopted the term theonomy. You notice I said he adopted the term. It's already in existence. He adopts it as a significant element in his system of thought many years before it ever became associated with Reconstruction thinking or thought. Tillich used theonomy, God's authority over man. That's what he understood it to be. When he used the word theonomy, he meant this is God ruling over man. Not necessarily a bad understanding. But he used it in conjunction with the word autonomy. Man as his own God or rule. And heteronomy. That is, there is some other outside authority which governs man, excluding both God and man himself. So there's a third type source of authority that is being identified. And he believed that these three understandings were the way that one could designate the various ways that men think and the way that they act individually and socially within their society. Dr. John Frame writes, and I quote, Theonomy can be defined simply as adherence to God's law, which would make all Christians, especially Reformed Christians, into theonomists. Here I define the term more narrowly as a school of thought within Reformed theology, which prefers literal, specific, and detailed applications of Mosaic civil laws to modern civil government, unquote. So what Dr. Frame shows is there are ways of interpreting it. When we say theonomy, we are talking about the law of God is defined by Puritans. So you got to say something as to an adjective that brings out our definition. We are confessional theonomists. That means we're Puritan in our view of the law of God. We believe in the moral obligation that we have. We're bound by the moral law of God to continue in its practices as it is required according to the teaching of Scripture, whatever time period you're looking at, whether it be Pre-mosaic, mosaic, post-mosaic, post into the time of Christ in the New Age. But you have to also define theonomy if someone like Dr. Rush Jr. or Dr. Bonson is speaking to it, and that they call Reconstructionism. I'll talk about what these things mean next Lord's Day as we look at the various varieties and presentations and views concerning the law of God, which will allow me to, stopping here, to go on and include dispensationalism, which I thought was going to have to be a, by itself, but I'll be able to include it next Lord's Day. And then you will have a very diverse understanding of how people are using this term, what they're trying to make concerning the teaching of the law of God as their perspective is set forth. That will help us to narrow out what it is we do not believe and put us back upon the focus of what it is that the scripture teaches as it is properly interpreted by the Westminster divines in the writing of their confession. But let me just say this to you in conclusion. There is a law called moral that was given to us from creation. It is written upon the very constitutional nature of man. And just in the principle of how God says in the created order of things, there is a Sabbath. There is a day of worship, God. That worship, whether it takes the form of pre-mosaic, mosaic, post-mosaic, post continues to bind us. And there are other things. Murder is given to us pre-mosaic, during the mosaic, and post-mosaic. There are principles which cannot ever be rejected. But there are also details that have changed. And that is where we have to theologically and hermeneutically interpret it correctly to understand what it was, how it was practiced in Israel, how it is practiced within the church and state today.
May God help us to ensure that we never forsake the moral law of God. That we are always walking in the precepts of that law. That we are law keepers in Christ, having been restored to God through Christ alone, by faith alone. But the law, never, because through human flesh we are weak, and it is weak, of necessity needed God to send in the likeness of sinful man his son to die for us. Because acceptance cannot be gained in a meritorious effort through the law on our part. But having been brought into relationship with God through the atoning work of Christ, through his imputed righteousness to us, there is a works that are involved in the way we live out our life before him. To negate that pure antinomianism, and it's a heresy. God has saved us, and he has saved us to keep his commands, just as the Son kept the will of God, we too are to keep the will of God, both in our relationship to God and our relationship to man. It has full moral implications in the three realms that God created, family, church, ceremonial, and state, civil. But not the details are necessarily binding any longer. Keep that in mind. Let us hold that thought till we get to look through all of these other things, and then it will become even more clearer, I believe, when we get into examining the teaching of the divine's And what they meant concerning the law of God. It is very important for us to understand the differences of the interpretation of law. In order to sort out and to do away with all the misconceptions that we might be able to rightfully state what is and is not binding upon us from God. A sovereign God who has given a law from creation that binds us to him. You are in a theonomic relationship with God, whether you're saved or not. And we'll talk about that because it's very important to understand. May God help us to be a confessional people who seek to understand the right interpretation an application of God and his law in our church and society today, in our personal life, as we are to be governed by God. May God help us see that. May we commit ourselves to its understanding. Shall we pray?